So uh, for the last two weeks, we've been in this series called How to Worship a King how to worship a king. And we've been talking about that. What does worship look like? What does worship look like from a biblical stance beyond simply just the time of music and singing? Because usually when we talk about worship, that's the first thing we think about, right? We think about music. We think about singing. And so we've been going through um, and talking about what is actually worship and how do we worship Jesus as king? Because I think this is one that we often forget and one that we often lose. Because we obviously we view God and we view Jesus as God and as Savior and, and all of that. But sometimes I think we forget that he's also a king. He's also a king. And so last week uh, we asked the question, what is worship? And, and, and we looked at three different words in three different languages that defined worship. In English, we, we understood that the word worship actually comes from the word worth-ship, worth-ship, which basically assigns value to something. How much is this thing worth to you? We talked about that. Worship always assigns value. And in the context with God, the question is, how much is God worth to you? How much is he worth? Because worship, too, always carries with it a component of sacrifice. Worship is going to cost us something. How much is God worth to you? We also talked about the Hebrew word abad, which means bond servant. And a bond servant is different from a slave because a bond servant chooses to remain with their master and serve them because they love them that much. Even when the bond servant has the option and the choice to go anywhere else, to do anything else, to serve anyone else, he chooses his master because he loves him that much. Remember, we even looked through a lot of the patriarchs of the faith in the New Testament, Paul and Peter and James and Jude, and how even in their letters, they would often introduce themselves Paul, a bondservant of Christ. James, a bondservant. Jude, Peter, a bondservant. They identified themselves first and foremost by who they had chose to love and serve. Before any other title, before any other description, they said, this is how I am going to identify myself, by the one I have chosen to serve because I love them that much. And then the last word we looked at was a Greek word for worship, often found in the New Testament, and it's the Greek word um, proskunio, proskunio. And there's a few definitions of that, but the one we talked about last week was uh, to blow kisses towards, to blow kisses towards, that worship is also an act of love and affection with that. That's what worship is. And so today, as we continue in this series, we're going to be asking ourselves the question, what is praise? What is praise? And I know right now you're thinking, well, Pastor Matt, isn't that a little bit redundant? Because, you know, praise and worship, aren't they the same? And the answer is no, they're not. They're actually different. Now, we've made them the same again because we've taken the music in church and we've given it the label and the title and the category praise and worship, praise and worship. So obviously they're the same, right? Or at best, as worship leaders, we put them into these categories. Well, praise are the fast songs and worship are the slow ones. I need more praise songs. I don't have enough fast stuff. Everyone's writing slow worship stuff. I need fast praise. But it's actually more than that. Let me give you a couple de uh, definitions of praise. Number one, praise, an expression of approval or admiration. An expression of approval or admiration. When my kids do well on their grades at school, I praise them for a job well done. I approve of their work. When the staff here update me on things they're working on, I praise them to show my approval. Thank you, great job. When my oldest son shows me a new lead line he's learned on the electric guitar, he's already surpassed me in his talent and skill. 
He came to me one day, he's like, Dad, I wanna learn how to start playing electric. I was like, son, here's the iPad and YouTube. You're gonna have to search for it. I said, because you've already like, Dad knows four chords and no more, but that's all I need for modern worship music. But when he shows me a new one, I praise him for it because I admire what he has done. Listen, two years ago at school, His school was uh, playing a Christmas program and they were gonna do some rendition of uh, Carol of the Bells. And Caden went to his teacher and he said, I can play the lead line for that on on electric guitar. Now, if you've ever heard the Trans-Siberian Orchestra rendition of that, this is like one of the hardest lead lines on electric guitar ever written. My son had been playing electric guitar for like all of one month. And his confidence, he walks in and to his teacher, he's like, oh yeah, I could do that. I could do that. And then he came home and he's like, dad, I'm gonna play this in the program. I was like, son, you, you barely even know how to do that. He's like, I'm gonna do it. And you know what? He did. Amen. He did. And so when he showed me that, I was like, I praised him for it. Why? Because I admired what he was able to do. Listen, We even do this if you've ever owned a dog. You know how to praise. When you're training them to do things you want them to do, the trainers will even tell you, if you've even ever taken your dog or your puppy to obedience or training school, they will tell you, when the dog does something you want them to do, what do you have to do? You have to show them praise. Why? So they know, okay, this is what I need to do to make my master happy and get a a treat because what's rewarded is repeated. And so we even understand this at a very basic level with animals. Praise is an expression of approval or admiration. Another definition, praise is an expression of respect or gratitude. When my children do the chores I have asked them to do, I praise them because I am grateful for what they have done. When my wife makes dinner, when she cleans the house, I praise her to show my gratitude. When I make dinner, when I clean the house, she praises me to show gratitude. (laughs) She just got blessed. I just got blessed. (laughs) And the key I want you to pick up in both of these definitions is that praise is an expression and expression. How will my kids, my dog, or my spouse know that I approve, admire, respect, or am grateful for their actions unless I express it, unless I tell them, unless I show them? Listen, unexpressed praise is not praise at all. Unexpressed praise is not praise at all. I'm sorry, but the attitude and the approach of, listen, I told you I loved you at our wedding day, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. That doesn't fly. (laughs) That doesn't work. That doesn't make for a happy, healthy marriage, and can I tell you, that doesn't make for a happy, healthy relationship with God. It is healthy for us to express our praise to God and to not hold it in because unexpressed praise is not praise at all. And so this morning as we explore this idea, what is praise? These are the three areas we're gonna look at. Why do we praise the benefits of praise and biblical expressions of praise, okay? So I'm gonna hit a lot of content today, but I promise I'm gonna get you out of here before two o'clock, okay? Here we go. First, Subcategory, why do we praise? Why do we praise? Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, we praise God for who he is. We praise God for who he is. Look at Psalm 100, verses four and five. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Listen, church, praise always has to begin first and foremost with who God is. 
Praise always starts there. It always starts for who God is. Praising God for who he is reminds us that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is kind, that he is merciful, righteous, and just, that he is holy, caring, forgiving, provider, protector, and healer. And I could go on and on and on. Praising God for who he is reminds us who he is. And listen, it reminds us that nothing about God changes even when our current circumstances do. That's why praise has to start with who God is. That even though my current circumstance isn't good, God still is. That even though my spouse has been unfaithful, God is still faithful. That even though I just got my two weeks notice from my job and I don't know where the next paycheck is coming from, that was never my source and my provider. God is still my provider. I praise him for who he is, not what is currently going on in my life. Praise has to begin with who God is first, no matter the nature of our current circumstances. And listen, let's be honest. If I only praise God when life was good, I'd only praise him at least 50% of the time, maybe even less. If I only praise God when life was good, I'd only give him praise 50% of the time. And listen, can I tell you what I have found? I have found in my life that I'd actually need to praise God during the hard times because that's where I find my strength to get through them and to get through the other side. That even though life is hard right now, even though this is unfair, even though this is unjust, even though I have more questions than answers right now, I'm going to choose to praise God for who he is. And that's going to give me the strength to get through this and to get to the other side. That even though I don't feel it, And even though I'm thinking differently towards God right now because of my circumstances, I'm going to choose to declare truth and praise him for who he is. He has not changed. He's still holy. He's still good. And guess what? He's still worthy of my praise, of my expressed praise. Number two, why do we praise God for what he has done? We praise him for who he is, and then we praise him for what he has done. We look back, and we remember. Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he has done for me. Praise not only reminds us of who God is, but it reminds us of all that he has already done that is worthy of approval, admiration, respect, and gratitude. It's interesting, there are many songs throughout the Old Testament, not just in the book of Psalms, but many other songs of books where prominent people in the Old Testament actually wrote songs to teach the people of Israel, and many of them recounted what God had done, what he had already done, so they would not forget. Because here's the thing, when we don't praise God for what he's done, we quickly forget all that he's done. How many of you have been in a situation where life gets hard, where it throws you a curveball, where something unexpected comes up, and our first reaction is to panic, right? Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We don't have that money. We weren't planning for this. We didn't expect that. How are we going to get through this? We panic. Instead of sitting and saying, listen, this isn't the first time something like this has happened, and it won't be the last. So instead of panicking, And instead of complaining, let's remember what God has already done. Let's remember what he did before. Let's remember what he did last time. Let's remember his goodness, his faithfulness, his provision. And let's praise him for that. 
See, when we don't praise God for what he's done, we doubt his character. God, are you really good? Are you really loving? Are you really kind? Do you even see me? Do you know me? Do you even care what's going on? We question his motives. God, why are you punishing me? Why are you causing this to happen? When we refuse to praise, we become skeptical critics rather than trusting children. Listen, no matter what is going on in my kid's life, they don't question, they don't become skeptical critics of every decision that I make as their father. No, they trust me. Why? Because I've proven that they can trust me before. And so they trust me now and they trust me later. Praising God for what he's done reminds us of what he's done and who he is and leads us to the next reason of why we praise. Number three, we praise God for what he is going to do. We praise God for who he is, we praise God for what he's done, and we praise him for what he is going to do. I love the story of Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16. Remember, they had been arrested, they had been thrown into prison, and not just any prison. They had been thrown into maximum security in the inner cell. And remember in Acts 16, um, the author records that at midnight, Paul and Silas started praying. They started singing hymns to God. They were praising God. And then what happened? God sent an earthquake, and not just any earthquake, an earthquake strong enough to loosen their shackles and break them off their wrists and their ankles and open the prison doors, but not so strong to cause the entire structure to cave in and kill everyone. Have you ever thought about that? It was at the perfect magnitude. In the midst of their praise, God answered their prayers and brought an earthquake that brought freedom. See, too often we choose complaining rather than praising, and then we wonder why nothing seems to be happening. See, Paul and Silas had every right to complain. God, we're out here doing the thing that you've called us to do, and look what happened. Look what happened. Paul could have said, you know what? I should have stayed with the Pharisees. Silas said, I never should have met this guy. They could have chosen to complain, and what would have happened? Nothing. Instead, they chose to praise, and what happened? the miraculous. Praise God for who he is. Praise him for what he's done. Praise him for what he's going to do and watch him intervene in your circumstances. And and listen, let me just throw this out there. Your situation may not change immediately. And in fact, your situation may not change at all. But here's what I do know. Choosing to praise God will change you. It will change you. It will change your heart. It will change your perspective. It will change your outlook. And listen, this is the part that a lot of people don't like to hear, but listen, sometimes that was the only part that needed to change. Sometimes we are the only thing that needed to change in this situation, not everyone else. And that's often where I start my prayer. God, change them. God, fix them. God, remove them. God, make them, make them, make them. And God's like, okay, Matt, how about we focus on you for a second? I'm like, no, God, I don't want to do that. It would be so much easier if everyone else just changed. He's like, I know, but that's not really how it works. Praise him for what he is going to do. The next part I want to look at, let's look at the benefits of praise. Because everyone loves to know the benefits, right? What is this going to do for me? What do I get out of this? What are the benefits of praise? Miss Judy, you're okay. You have one. Okay. Just want to make sure you don't choke out on me up here. All right. Preacher and paramedic. That's what we're doing today. Benefits of praise, number one, it positions us to enter into the promises of God. Praise positions us to enter 
into the promises of God. Leave that slide up there, guys. You remember when, uh, when God brought the children of Israel to the edge of the promised land, and they were getting ready to go in, and before they went in, what did they do? They chose 12 spies from the 12 tribes, and they said, y'all go into the promised land, check it out, come back with a report. 40 days later, they come back with a report. And, and listen, they all gave the same report. All 12 spies gave the same report. This is good land. This is great land. This is everything that God said it would be and even more. However, there are people in this land, big people, scary people, strong people. Ten of the spies said, because of the people in the land and their size and their strength and their might and their power, we can't take it. We can't do it. It's too hard. It's too difficult. But two of the spies came back with a different perspective. Look at Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 7. The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. What were Joshua and Caleb doing? They were praising God for who he is. And they were praising God for what he was about to do. They were giving him praise. They were positioning themselves to enter into the promises of God. But we all know what happened. The majority decided to go with the 10. And they said, we can't do it. Turn around. We're not going in. And so then what did God do? God punished them. He said, okay, y'all don't want to go in? Y'all don't want to put your faith in me. You don't want to believe me. You don't want to trust my word. That's fine. Do laps for 40 years in the wilderness. And an entire generation of faithless, disobedient people died off in the 40 years in the wilderness until a new generation rose up. And Joshua and Caleb, however, 80 years old at this point, were allowed to enter in. Why? Because they chose praise rather than fear. They chose praise rather than complaining. Listen, how many of us are missing out on our promised lands and stuck in the desert because we're choosing faithless complaining rather than faith-filled praise? God has promises for some of y'all. In fact, he's shown you those promises. But let's be honest, they're big, they're scary, they're intimidating. There's some battles that are ahead. And rather than stepping forward in faith, we've chosen to shrunk back in fear. And we're not positioning ourselves to enter into those promises. God says, if you'll start with praise for who I am and what I'm about to do, then you can walk into those promises. Praise positions us to enter into the promises. Second benefit of praise, number two, God shows up when his people praise. God shows up when his people praise. God shows up. Look at Psalm 22, verse 3. Yet you are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. Enthroned. On the praises of Israel, some versions say, you who inhabit or you who dwell in the praises of your people. Think about it this way. Our praises actually build a throne from which God sits on and he rules and he reigns. And so the question then for us today is, how big a throne is your praise building? How big a throne is your praise building? Is your praise building a throne big enough and strong enough that is worthy of the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the maker of all things, and by which they are held together and have their breath and their meaning? Does your praise build a throne that big? Or... Is it so small that you wouldn't even dare set a child on it? 
lest it snap and break and crumble beneath their weight. I believe the degree to which we see the kingdom of God ruling and reigning and at work in our lives has a direct correlation with how much praise we give him. Let me say that again. I believe the degree to which we see the kingdom of God ruling and reigning in our lives has a direct correlation to how much praise we give him. Let me say it this way. If we want to see a bigger God, we need to start with bigger praise that builds a bigger throne. If you want to see a bigger God at work in your life, start building him a bigger throne by giving him bigger praise. Third benefit of praise this morning, praise is spiritual warfare. Praise is spiritual warfare. Expressed praise, approval, admiration, respect, gratitude is spiritual warfare. One of my favorite stories in all of the Bible, it's in 2 Chronicles 20, and I've taught from this from many times. This uh, story is about King Jehoshaphat in the kingdom of Judah, and when he's going to war against three enemy armies, and, and look at the instructions that the Lord gives him, 2 Chronicles 20, beginning in verse 21. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang, give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of the enemy had escaped. King Jehoshaphat and his men went out to gather the plunder. They found vast amounts of equipment, clothing, other valuables, more than they could carry. There was so much plunder, it took them three days just to collect it all. And on the fourth day, they gathered in the Valley of Blessing, which got its name that day, because the people praised and thanked the Lord there, still called the Valley of Blessing today. Praise is spiritual warfare. Praise is spiritual warfare because of this. Praise is the language of truth. Praise is the language of truth. Praise is declaring the truth of who God is, what he's done, what he is going to do. It disarms the enemy, expressing and declaring who God is, what he's done. And listen, the lies of the enemy can't stand up against the truth of God. They can't. They can't. And so listen, when you choose to open up your mouth and speak and sing praises to God, you are waging war in the spirit realm against an unseen enemy, which Paul reminds us is actually our true battle and our fight. He says, we don't wage war against flesh and blood. People aren't your enemy. They're actually your brothers and your sisters. They're people that Jesus went to the cross for. People aren't your enemy. He says, no, we wage war in the heavenlies. We wage war against the spirit realm. We wage war against the powers of darkness. And how do we do that? One way is through praise through opening your mouth and declaring the truth of who God is, what he's done, and what he is going to do. Praise is how we fight our battles, and praise is how we win our battles. This last section I'm going to look at, and I'm going to go through these quickly, is uh, biblical expressions of praise. And I chose that first word very intentionally. These are biblical expressions of praise. These are not Pastor Matt's preferences. This is not how we do it at Harvest. This is not just because we're in the South or because we're a Pentecostal church. Some of you just found that out right now and you got nervous. <laughs> this is a Pentecostal church. Good Lord, where do they keep the snakes? You'll find out next week. So, biblical expressions of praise. Biblical, number one, singing. 
Number one, singing Psalm 30, verse four. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. Are you a godly one? Yes, you are. Therefore, you have been commanded to sing. Congratulations, you're all in the choir. And listen, singing is not just reserved for the musically gifted and talented. Singing is for everyone. I love what Zach Neese says in his book, How to Worship a King. He says, we don't sing to God because we are good singers. We sing because he is a good God. Let me say that again. We don't sing to God because we're good singers. We sing to God because he's a good God. Listen, just like any parent loves to hear their child singing in the back of the car, forgetting words, adding words, making up their own lyrics, Some of you do that still. (laughs) Listen, just in the same way any parent loves to hear their child sing so innocently, it doesn't matter if they're on pitch, if they're on key, if they get all the words right, none of that matters. Parents just love to hear their children sing in the same way your heavenly father loves to hear you sing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be on key. You don't have to know all the words. He just loves to hear your voice. Not because you have a great voice, but because what is coming out of your mouth is a reflection of what is in your heart. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is coming out of your mouth It began right here in your heart. That's why Jesus loves to hear us sing. And listen, that's why we keep the music loud in here. So your neighbor next to you can't hear how off key you are, okay? Don't even worry about it. Let it out. Sing loud. Sing proud. Sing off key. We'll keep pushing the volume up, okay? Don't worry about it. The second A biblical example of praise is with instruments, with instruments. Psalm 150, praise him with a blast of the ram's horn, praise him with the lyre and harp, praise him with the tambourine and dancing, praise him with strings and flutes, praise him with a clash of cymbals, praise him with loud, with loud, with loud, clanging cymbals. Amen. That's all we need to say about that one. The third Example of praise is shouting, shouting. I love this one, 1 Samuel chapter 4. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud it made the ground shake. It made the ground shake. What's going on, the Philistines asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried, this is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Shouting lets the world know there is a king and there is a God in our midst. That's why we shout. Shouting declares joy, celebration, courage, and victory. Psalm 47 verse one says, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Shouting is an expression of praise. Number four, clapping hands. This is the first part of the verse I just read, Psalm 47, 1. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I love clapping because clapping brings all of us, the entire body, the entire congregation, from up here on the platform all the way to the back row. It brings us all together. And we clap on two and four because God is a God of order, not a God of dissonance and chaos. So we clap on two and four all together. Number five, lifting hands. This is where some of you just put your seatbelt on. You're like, ooh, I don't know if I'm there, Pastor Matt. Again, these are biblical examples. Not Pastor Matt's preferences, not just for the Pentecostals. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. This is why we lift our hands in praise. There's a few reasons why. Number one, lifting hands is a sign of surrender. We've all seen it in the old westerns, 
TV shows, someone says, stick them up. What happens? <laughs> I surrender. I surrender. Hands up is a sign of surrendering to God. Not only that, hands up is a sign of desire and affection. When your kids were little and they wanted you, what did they do? Hold me. Hold me. Dad, hold me. Mom, hold me. It's a sign of desire and affection. Lastly, lifted hands it is a posture of receiving. If I'm going to give you something, how do you receive it? You have to put your hands out to receive it. That's why we lift our hands. And listen, if you've never done it before, you don't have to start right here. Maybe you just start here one Sunday. <laughs> then you go to both. And then you get a little bit more. And a little more. And then maybe it's one. And maybe you point. And if you're really feeling good, multiples of 10. <laughs> Listen, the first time I lifted my hands, it did. It felt weird. It felt weird. Some of you know my story. I came from the Catholic Church and then went full-blown into Foursquare, not even knowing what Foursquare was. Our extended family thought we joined a cult. For real. And uh, I remember the first time in there, like, one, the music was really loud. I was like, I don't know if you're allowed to play music this loud in church. Like, this seems a little sacrilege. And then, yeah, when it would get to the slow songs, people were doing this. And I was like, what? Like, is this Superman practice? Well, what are we doing here? What are we doing? The first time I tried it, I was like, all right, we're going to try this thing. And so, yeah, I kind of went here, you know, holding the TV. It's, it's a small TV. It's not a big screen. It's, it's a smaller one. Kind of went here. I was like, all right, this feels kind of weird, but nothing bad has happened, so that's good. And then tried a little more, and a little more, and a little higher. And listen, now I'm at the point I can't imagine worshiping without lifting my hands. Amen. And you'll see me on the front row every Sunday. It's this, it's usually a point, depending on the rhythm, it'll be this. Like, if I'm really feeling it, but I can't imagine worshiping and not lifting my hands. Again, this is a biblical example. This is not Pastor Matt's opinion. This is not just because we're weird, crazy Pentecostals. Which some of you are. Some of us aren't. The last one I want to look at is bowing. Bowing, Psalm 95, 6, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Why don't you stand with me this morning? I love it how in two of our four songs that we sang this morning, we actually sang about bowing down. The lion and the lamb, every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. The hymn of heaven, there will be a day when all will bow before him. Of all of the biblical expressions of praise, singing, instruments, shouting, clapping, lifting hands, bowing is the most prevalent in both the Old and the New Testament. The Greek Again, this word we've talked about, proscunio, means to bow. It literally means to lay face down on the ground, prostrate before the Lord. That is the most used word in the New Testament for worship. And so when people heard worship, they didn't think music, they thought bowing. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word was Shabbat, and it means to bow, to bow. Bowing shows submission, and it breaks us of our pride. Bowing demonstrates lordship, and it recognizes a king. 
Growing up in the Catholic Church, it was common when you would enter into the church before Mass, before you would enter into your pew, you would enter in and you would take a knee and you would bow and then you would enter into your pew. For years, Sarah and I led a Monday night service at another Foursquare church, and a guy that played drums with us, he was raised Catholic, and he would do that. Every time before he would go into his row, he would take a knee. Before he would walk up onto the platform, onto the stage to take his place on the drums, he would take a knee. When my grandfather passed away and we went to Pennsylvania for his funeral. It was in a Catholic church and I was preparing to sing at the end of his service and I was following the priest around. He was helping me and every time he would approach, uh, the, in, in Catholic churches they call it the Eucharist, it's the platform, it's the stage. Every time he would approach it, he would always kneel. And we were back and forth, back and forth. Like I almost tripped over this priest probably five or six times because I'm right behind him. And he would, like, he would give me no warning. He just assumed I knew this was going to happen. And he'd come up to it, drop a knee, and I'm like, whoa, almost got you there, Father. We bow, we bow. I love this, Revelation chapter four. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. I love the way Zach says this in his book. He says, the 24 most powerful beings in heaven have been given crowns not for their heads, but for the beautification of God's feet. They've been given thrones not to elevate themselves, but to give them a higher position from which to humble themselves and bow before their king. How do we worship a king? We worship a king by bowing by submitting and surrendering, by recognizing his lordship. And so as we end today, I want to give you an opportunity to practice your praise today. Because again, praise is expressed, and unexpressed praise is not praise at all. And so I want to take us through some of these biblical examples of praise. And I want us to start with bowing. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you are physically able, if you can actually drop to your knees and bow, I would encourage you to do that. If that's difficult for you, you can at least drop your chin and bow your head. And recognizing Jesus as King. So if you would, let's begin there. Let's begin with bowing. Jesus, we worship you. We recognize you as King of Kings, as Lord of Lords. God, we humble ourselves before you now in your presence and we bow down. We bow to the King of Kings. Lord, we're not waiting for that one day when every knee will bow. God, we choose to practice our praise now and bow before the King. Lord, we submit and we surrender to your rule, to your reign in our lives. Lord, don't just be Savior. Be Lord. Be King. God, we, we bow. Now you can stay in that position, but I want us to move into singing and to lifting hands as we sing, holy, holy, holy. 